I guess I warn you now, I have a sore throat. So if I start coughing, I'm not dying, I'm just coughing. And hopefully whoever's controlling sound will lower it. And I have a cup of tea and there's more tea there and we'll get through this. So uh, good morning, thanks for having me. Uh, I, what I wanna talk about, I mean, I actually I thought about talking about several things. I thought about, talk, thought about talking about human behavior. And I'm, I'm just right now finishing a book on security and trust in human behavior. And it's coming out in February. And to be a little honest, I'm, I'm about sick of the topic. I just spent the last year really thinking about it. So instead, I wanna talk about something that's a little more political and I think a little more central to, uh, to us on the internet as we look at the future of the internet. And I wanna talk about cyber war. But not in the scary way, you might think, but in, in, in a more sensible way. So last June, I participated in a debate. It was in Washington, D.C. And the debate was, the, debate, the topic of the debate was the threat of cyber war has been grossly exaggerated. This was an actual debate, right? There were sides, there was winning. I'd never done this before. And two of us were against the proposition, that the, sorry, we were for the proposition that the threat of cyber war has been grossly exaggerated, myself and the director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. On the other side, two people debated that the threat has not been grossly exaggerated. Uh, that was Admiral Mike McConnell, who used to run the National Security Agency of the United States, and a law professor named Jonathan Zittrin, who, who might, might have read his stuff. And I thought this would be easy. Right? We would get up, I'd list uh, a bunch of gross cyber exaggerations, we'd all vote and, and, and we'd win. And the way the, uh, the, winning, the, the way they determined winning was interesting. They polled the audience before the debate and again after the debate, and the side that changed the most minds won. So uh, we lost that debate. At the end of the hour, the most of the audience thought that the threat of cyber war had not been grossly exaggerated. And it really wasn't until the months after that debate, thinking about what happened, that I really came to understand what I think the problem is with the term cyber war and with what's happening on the internet in terms of security. So I had some great cyber war exaggerations. I had Admiral Mike McConnell, the person on the other side of the stage, saying in the, in the Washington Post, uh, in American newspaper, the United States is fighting a cyber war today and we're losing, right? He said, we are a nation at war. Uh, the Miami Herald uh, said, Cuba is capable of, capable of raging a cyber war. I had uh, an American senator talk about cyber Katrina. Uh, an Australian newspaper, The Independent, headline, hackers declare cyber war on Australia, right? Cyber war is so easy, even kids can do it. Uh, Amit Yaran, I don't know if you recognize that name, he was the second U.S. national cybersecurity advisor after someone named Richard Clark, who I'll, I'll mention again later. He said in, in 2009, cyber 9-11 has happened over the last 10 years, but it's happened slowly so we don't see it. I don't even know what that means. Uh, had uh, newspaper headlines around China. China is, 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 a, is a big uh, perpetrator of cyber war. Germany attacks China for starting the cyber war. China declares war on Western search sites. You can declare a war on companies now. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, cyber blitz hits US Korea. So I had cyber war, cyber 9-11, cyber Katrina, cyber blitz, cyber Pearl Harbor. My favorite was cyber Armageddon. I mean, this is what gross exaggerations look like. Now, if you think about, if you've read about cyber war, either in the press or uh, just in articles in magazines, there are, there are several examples that pop out. The, the first one you always hear about, <coughs> well, that was a mistake, is Estonia. In April 2007, there were a series of denial of service attacks against uh, government and commercial sites in Estonia. If you read the press reports at the time, uh, they'll say it was unprecedented. There were attacks the magnitude you'd never seen before. That's all not true. There were regular denial of service attacks. And this was during a time of, of tensions between the governments of Russia and Estonia. So it was widely believed that Russia did this, that somehow Russia started a cyber war by attacking Estonia. Uh, Russia has never admitted this. 
And, and this is something we'll see again and again when we look at examples. It's very hard to know who did it. I mean, unlike a regular war. And in fact, the only person ever convicted of launching these attacks was a 22-year-old ethnic Russian living in Tallinn at the time who was annoyed at, at a, a, a statue being pulled down of a public square. So maybe cyber war is so easy, even kids can do it. As an example of war, it's, it's sort of odd. Right? It's like the enemy uh, lands on your beaches, and then they all, the army just runs in front of you in line at the post office. Right? It was not a, a service attack. Nothing was destroyed. Things were just <clears throat> delayed. Uh, another example, I, mean, I have a bunch of examples. In October of 07, uh, there was a, an attack by Israel against Syria, a Syrian nuclear power plant. Uh, this was not a cyber attack, this was a conventional attack. Right? There were, there were pl uh, planes dropped bombs on a Syrian nuclear power plant. Uh, but during that attack, the Israeli government used a cyber attack to disable air defense systems in Syria and neighboring countries so the planes could get in and out faster. And, and safer. To also 2007 in Brazil, uh, this was the uh, lead story in a, there's a US news magazine, 60 Minutes, and they did a story on cyber war. And, and they used this example as, as their example of cyber war. In Brazil, there were a series of blackouts in 2007. And these have been blamed on cyber extortionists. That some criminal gang said to the government or whoever, you know, we're going to. We can take down your power plants. Here, let's demonstrate. Now give us money. Uh, this has never been confirmed. It could, uh, there's, I've seen a report saying it was dirt in the insulators that caused the blackouts, not a cyber attack at all. We don't actually know. August of 08 in Georgia, another ex-Soviet republic, there was an attack very similar to what happened in Estonia, a denial of service attack against government sites. The difference is this was a This was a precursor to, uh, to a land invasion. Right? Russian uh, tanks and, and troops you know, going into Georgia. And again, this was blamed on Russia. And, and again, uh, Russia never said, yes, we did it. And, and to this day, we don't know if it was, it was state-sponsored, state-tolerated, or, or, or just kids playing politics. Now, what's interesting, if you think about these four examples, and when I was thinking about the debate, the, the thing that strikes me is that there isn't a good definition of cyber war. I mean, the real problem we have is we don't know what cyber war is. We don't know when it starts. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know, you know how you know it's over. But, and it's not just newspaper headline writers. Even computer security experts, right, even military strategists don't have good definitions of these things. It's really hard to talk about cyber war when we don't know what we're talking about. I mean, clearly we're not fighting an actual war. The war, U.S. is not at war with China. That's just silly. Right? And, <coughs> and in the U.S., I don't know what it is here, we have a very weird relationship with the word war. We hate using the word when there's an actual war. We never like calling wars wars. We love using the word when there's no war. Right? War on terror, war on crime, war on drugs, war on poverty. We like fighting rhetorical wars. It makes us feel good somehow. So you know, what you're seeing here is, is the term war used rhetorically for something that has some aspects of war. And that's causing a lot of cognitive confusion. And I think it's really dangerous to apply the term war when you don't really know what's going on. I mean, I guess this is the point of the talk, right? I mean, this sentence. It's not that we're fighting a cyber war, but that we're increasingly seeing warlike tactics used in more general cyber conflicts. Right? It used to be, in the real world, it's easy to know when you're at war. Right? When you look down the street and you see a tank, you know there's a war because only governments can afford tanks. Right? The weapons themselves tell you whether it's war or not. In cyberspace, it doesn't work that way. Everyone's got the same weapons. Denial of service attacks, sabotage. 
right? Root kits. I mean, all of the things that, that you see in wartime, you also see in peacetime. All the things that are used by militaries are also used by criminals, are also used by hackers. Right? Technology is spreading capability. So it's very hard to tell when you're at war. So let's see some more examples of these broader cyber conflicts. Uh, first one is GhostNet. GhostNet was discovered in March of 2009. It's a very large, sophisticated surveillance network. It was discovered by some security researchers when they were doing an audit of the Dalai Lama's computers. You follow it backwards, and uh, it, uh, it, was, it was deployed against about 100 different political, economic, and media targets. In, sorry, in about 100 different countries. And again, like all these examples, we never know who, do, who, who, who did it, so we try to guess. The list of targets was basically a who's who of who China wants to spy on. So we all believe China was behind it. But again, you know, China never admitted it. Uh, in July of 2009, there were some attacks, again, denial of service attacks, against the United States and South Korea. All right, so US and South Korea are targets. Obviously, North Korea did it. But again, we don't know, actually. And if you follow that one back, this was an interesting one. There was at least one lawmaker in the United States that said we should strike back kinetically. Right, we should actually fire weapons back at the country that did this. And when they traced the attack, it either came from China, London, or Florida. Right? So f striking back would have been awkward if it were Florida. You know, we have this problem again and again. Uh, January of last year, Google, I don't know if you remember this, Google announced that they were the victim of, of broad attacks from China against the Gmail accounts of Chinese dissidents. And, and, and you know, the, again and again, we see a lot of attacks emanating from China. And again, we never know how much of this is, is state-sponsored or state-tolerated. We believe that a lot of it is just state-tolerated, that it's independent groups acting in China, and they just uh, you know, are given a free hand by the government and, and, and know if they find anything good, they should pass it back. Uh, June of last year, uh, the world discovered Stuxnet. Stuxnet is the, uh, f the first military-grade cyber weapon we've ever seen. It was developed by, the, uh, by Israel and the United States, and it was uh, designed to uh, damage an Iranian nuclear power plant, which it did quite effectively. You know, and, and again, you know, none of that we know for sure. No one's admitted it, but you know, we, we're pretty sure. I mean, a lot of other things fall into this rubric of <clears throat> you know, broad cyber conflicts. In the last three US elections, we've seen cyber attacks against candidates and parties. Never by the rival candidate or party, always by just some free agent thinking they could, they could do good by doing damage. Right, in response to WikiLeaks, we've seen the hacker group Anonymous hack you know, quite a number of uh, corporate and government sites. The first one was, was against the H HB, I don't know people heard the story. Uh, Wiki, uh, Anonymous, the hacker group Anonymous, attacked HB Gary. HB Gary was a cybersecurity company. And the hacker group kind of took them apart pretty severely. It was, it was quite impressive. You know, one of the things we learned is that HB Gary is a cyber weapons arms manufacturer of the United States. I didn't even know we had cyber weapons arms manufacturers. You know, where we had one, uh, we certainly have many. Uh, I'm going to give you two old examples that I think are, I think are important. In 1982, it's 1982, the U.S. inserted a malicious code into Canadian software that was sent to the then Soviet Union for use on the Trans-Siberian Pipeline. Uh, the resultant explosion is, is still the largest non-nuclear explosion in, uh, on, on our planet's history. And you think about it, it's sort of very similar to Stuxnet you know, 30 years earlier. Uh, in 1991, the U.S. government inserted malicious code in printers that were sent to Iraq, and those were used to help disable Iraqi air defense systems during the first Iraqi Gulf War in, in 1991. All right, so a lot of stuff isn't very new. All right, so, so think about these examples. I tried to give a broad array of, of these, these cyber conflicts. 
When you think about defense in cyberspace, well, think about it this way. When you're attacked in cyberspace, there are a variety of institutions you can call on to defend yourself. Right? You can call on the police. You can call on the military. You can call on you know, some intelligence service. You can call on whatever counterterrorism service you have. You can call on some commercial products and services. You can call on your corporate lawyers. And the legal framework for you to deal with an attack depends on two things. Who's attacking you and why? But on the internet, when you're being attacked, the two things you don't know are who's attacking you and why. And that makes defense difficult. So it's more than that we don't have a good definition of cyber war. It's that we don't know where the boundaries are between various cyber attacks. You know, when you, it's every, in those examples, everyone was using denial of service attacks. Everyone uses data theft, data manipulation, sabotage. So you don't know if it's a hacker, a criminal, a spy, and a, an opposing government. And if you don't know any of that, you don't know who to call. Right? So a lot of this falls under the, uh, the rubric of advanced persistent threat. I don't know if you, if you know that buzzword. It appeared a couple of years ago. And, and for a long time, I hated it. I didn't think it was useful. And I've come around. Right? What separates these sorts of threats from your typical criminal or hacker threat is that they're directed and not opportunistic. And so against a criminal who's trying to steal, I don't know, credit card numbers, right, you just have to be more secure than everyone else. Because a criminal just wants some credit card numbers. And they can be yours, they can be someone else's. Then the criminal doesn't care. Right, your typical hacker is just trying to hack somewhere. You know, most, most anonymous hacks, for example. So again, your security is judged relative to everyone else's security. If you're more secure than everyone else, then the bad guys will go attack them instead of you. An APT is different. An APT is directed towards you. For whatever reason, the attacker wants you. So, so your security level is judged much more in absolute terms. Are you strong enough to keep them out? Because there's no making them go away and attack somebody else. Right? So I think of this now as, as, as politically motivated hacking. And I think of politics very, very broadly here. Right? It's nationalistic. It's ethical. It's religious. And, and you'll see these attacks against governments, against corporations, against institutions, against individuals. Right? And, and, I mean, APT is used as a, uh, as a sales buzzword, and, and, and that I don't like. But I think it describes a very real phenomenon. Right? These politically motivated attacks where absolute security matters more than relative security. So there's a lot of politics of cyber war right now. And, and, and the politics worries me a great deal. I mean, the world is gearing up for cyber war. In, uh, in the end of 2010, we learned that the US Cyber Command is fully operational, whatever that means. Uh, UK has talked a lot about cyber war and their capabilities. NATO has. China has, for about a decade and a half, been writing about cyber, cyberspace as a theater of war. And cyber war, we know they spend a lot of effort on, on building their cyber war capabilities, other countries as well. Uh, there are power struggles within governments over who gets the, the budget and who gets the power. Generally, they're between the police and the military. Now, in the United States, it was a, a three-way battle between the, uh, the FBI, the DOD, Department of Defense, and the uh, National, and the, so the FBI, Department of Defense, and the Department of Homeland Security. And we know who won that battle because the U.S. Cyber Command is, uh, 
is run by General Keith Alexander, who also actually runs the NSA. And the U.S. Cyber Command is located at Fort Meade in the same place the NSA is located. <clears throat> right, so I mean, the, the NSA won that. Uh, the metaphors matter here, and I think this is really important. Right? To the police, we are all citizens to protect. To the military, we're a population to be subdued. Right? And the war metaphor, I mean, not only reinforces the notion that we're helpless, but it really makes a difference in policy discussions. Right? Because when you're talking about cybersecurity policy, you get different answers if you're at war or if you're at peace. Right, so let me give you some examples of, of the different policy discussions we're seeing in various countries that have, that have to do with cyber war. First one is military control. You know, again and again, we're seeing calls for the military to take over cybersecurity. Not, not for everything, but for, for important national industries. So you'll hear it for the national power grid or the internet backbone, that the military should take over security. You'll hear the military should take over uh, some protocols. You see it in, in wholesale surveillance. Right? You know, a bunch of examples of, uh, of governments. I mean, the United States is, is the one I know best of you know, eavesdropping on everybody whether it's phone calls or the internet, so this massive eavesdropping, which you would never see in peacetime. I mean, you'd never see the government allowing the police to do it, but the government allowing the military to do it is different. Now you see an eavesdropping facilitation. There are debates in the United States about whether the internet should be, should be changed to make it easier to eavesdrop on. You know, we saw this debate uh, in, uh, in several countries last year around blackberries. So I think it was fall of last year when the governments of both uh, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia said to RIM, you know, we can't eavesdrop on your blackberries. That annoys us. Please fix that. And RIM said, you know, we can't do that. The architecture doesn't allow it. And those countries said, that's nonsense. You did it for uh, Russia. You did it for China. You know, India at that point said, well, you, we, you, we want you to do that for us too. You know, and and you know, we, we learned that RIM reached an arrangement with these countries. And we know what that means, that, that now, you, now the governments can eavesdrop on blackberries within those countries. Right? I mean, that, that kind of battle is being fought on many levels with many different protocols. Uh, different laws about data retention. I don't know what the law is here in Sweden. I know in Germany, uh, data must be retained by ISPs on users for six months. Uh, some countries have a one-year data retention law. Some have a two-year data retention law. Right? And that allows the, the police to, you know, basically to eavesdrop on somebody backwards in time. I mean, tell me what this person has been doing on the Internet. And we're seeing more and more of those laws. Uh, last spring in the United States, and this will come up again, there was a debate on the internet kill switch. You know, the debate takes many forms. I like to think of it as a big red button on Obama's desk. Right? You can push it, the internet goes away. Uh, there's actually a debate about the, whether we should give the US president the ability to shut off the internet. This seems like a mistake to me. Because right, if you think about it, uh, you know, once we, we, we can't do that now. Right? At, at this point, we cannot build that big red button. We would have to do some redesigning of the net to allow that to happen. And if you think about it, once you redesign the net to allow for a big red button on Obama's desk to, to stop it, now I have to ensure that only the president can push that button. And that's a big security vulnerability. So that bill died, but it, it, it'll come back. You, you watch. You know, also, uh, we see poking up once, every once in a while the notion of attribution, mandatory attribution. The idea there is that the internet, all the problems of the net can be fixed if we just knew who everybody was. The problems are a result of anonymity. 
then anonymity is bad. I mean, not only does the, the argument make no sense, is that we cannot design an internet that doesn't allow anonymity. I mean, we just don't know how. But you see that debate again and again. <coughs> right, but when you look at these arguments, either for or against, I mean, the arguments are different if the metaphor is we are a world at peace or the metaphor is we are a world at war. Right? And that's important. You know, it, you know, controls we have in place to maximize freedoms tend to go away in wartime. Right, so, so what's the future here? I, I'm not saying cyber war will never exist. I mean, you know, I, I think the world needs to prepare for it. I mean, a U.S. cyber command is a perfectly reasonable thing to have. NATO, you know, needs cyber war capabilities. Because if there is war, it will expand to fill all available theaters. You know, and just like we saw in the United States and Iraq, we saw an air war preceding a ground war. I mean, next time you're likely going to see a cyber war preceding an air war preceding a ground war. Right, you know, as, you know, as we get you know, into more and more dangerous theaters of war. I think the debate on who secures critical infrastructure is, is critical. And I think we need to have that discussion. There are, there's levels of security that the markets won't get to, simply because of the externalities. So how, you know, what the role of government in, in these is, I think is real important. I like seeing uh, military strategy articles to talk about the uh, characteristics of cyber war. I mean, there are some basic things we need to understand. I mean, on the internet, attack is much easier than defense. So if there's a cyber war, it's likely to be a lot of attacking and not a lot of defending. There's also a notion of terrain in cyberspace. I mean, some countries are naturally more resistant. I mean, think of, I don't know, North Korea, where they have six computers. I mean, they're not going to be very vulnerable to a cyber attack. I suppose the United States, with you know, millions of computers used for very critical things, you know, we would be much more vulnerable. <coughs> right, the notion of, of who attacked you is important. I mean, the th interesting thing about all of those stories is you never knew who did it. Right, when Israel attacked Syria, attacked the Syrian nuclear power plant, the Syrians could look up in the sky and see the flag that was painted on the tail of the planes. Right, and they know who did it. When Iran was attacked by Stuxnet, they couldn't do that. Right, there was no return address on the cyber weapons. There's, a, there's an interesting book, and I sort of hesitate to recommend it. It's by Richard Clark. Richard Clark was the first US cybersecurity advisor. And the book is called Cyber War. The first half of the book is full of cyber war exaggerations, and I, I don't recommend it. I think it's terrible. The second half of the book discusses cyber war treaties. I think it's great, and it's real important to read. And he spends a lot of time talking about how cyber war treaties might look. You know, what international regulatory bodies might negotiate them. And I think that's something that, that we should all really start thinking about. Because we are in the early years of a cyber war arms race. And, and you can imagine different cyber war treaties, right? You know, no first use of cyber weapons, uh, minimized collateral damage, no attacks against civilian infrastructure, uh, no unnamed weapons. Weapons uh, have to self-destruct at the end of a conflict. I mean, you know, they, you can make up basic principles of a treaty. You know, and if you think about it, you know, you could probably think about you know how you might enforce some of these treaties. Enforcement's hard. I mean, there's a lot of lessons in nuclear treaties, but you know, we learned you know the past few years how hard it was to. Uh, to verify that uh, you know, Iraq didn't have a, you know, a nuclear facility. You know, a cyber war facility is even easier to hide. 
But even in the breach, I mean, one of the things the book makes clear is that even in, in breach, these treaties have a lot of value. That the act of negotiating them and, and mostly complying makes the world a safer place. Because I, you know, I don't think a, a, uh, an arms race is in anybody's best interest. Certainly not us on the internet. And I think the increasing militarization of the internet is something that we need to be concerned about. Because it limits how we use the net, either personally or, or, or as, as, as businesses. You know, even something as simple as a cyber command hotline would be a good thing. So the different countries' cyber commands would talk to each other. We do need to decide what an we do need to decide what an offensive action is in cyberspace, and we don't really have a good definition of that. I mean, there's a whole array of actions, right, from from defending yourself over here to actually attacking someone over there, and there's things like you know eavesdropping and building up attack capabilities. Uh, you know, making probing attacks. One of the things uncovered by uh, it's a U.S. Uh, reporter for the New Yorker, name is Seymour Hirsch, that several countries are attacking each other in cyberspace. I mean, doing tests and probes. It was similar to what you saw in the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, flying planes over to those countries. <coughs> but in this case, it seems more dangerous. That, that countries are leaving back doors in place, leaving uh, weapons in place that could be used later. You know, and, and this seems very dangerous. You know, if something happens by accident, so we could, you know, this could spiral into a larger conflict. You know, we need to establish rules of cyber engagement. You know, how is war, war fought in cyberspace? You know, do we need the equivalent of uniforms? for cyber weapons. What level of command should make the decision? You know, one of my worries in the United States is a lot of these decisions are being made at a very low level of command in the military. You know, I like to see the US president sign off on a lot of these things. I like the decisions to be made at a very, very high level. And something that no one really talks about is commandeering. I mean, it seems obvious to me if the United States is going to fight a cyber war, it's not going to use the computers in its military bases. It's going to use the computers that Google owns. That if there is a cyber conflict, I think we should all prepare, be prepared for the government commandeering our networks to use in this cyber war. We need to understand cyber mercenaries. You know, what happens when governments hire hackers or corporations to launch some of these attacks? How does that change things? You know, more, more broadly, you need to deal with the notion of non-state actors. And this gets back to the problem of, of definitions and cyber conflict. You can't tell the governments and the non-governments. Right? And whether it's kids playing politics you know, or terrorists, there are a lot of non-state actors out there doing warlike things. I mean, last year, the hacker group Anonymous warned NATO not to mess with it. You know, you know you think about that for a second. We're living in a world where a bunch of guys can threaten NATO. But that's not supposed to happen. And we don't know how to deal with that. You know, politically or socially. Or the notion of kids playing politics. A lot of the attacks we're seeing seem to be individual actors who are just trying to influence a broader political conflict. And whether it's a US election or a, you know, a geopolitical you know, US versus China, India versus Pakistan, Right, UK versus Ireland. You know, wherever you see political conflicts, you're now seeing individuals playing those conflicts out in cyberspace. <coughs> and we need to bid, build resilience into our infrastructures. And the lesson of, of a lot of these attacks is that our infrastructures are, are relatively fragile. 
that if there is actually any of these, any major cyber conflict, we need to have strong infrastructures. Right? Not in terms of striking back, but in terms of, of surviving an attack. I mean, and that's as, as nations and as, as corporations. Right? You know, if there's actual war, I mean, it's no longer business as usual on the internet. But when you see these broad cyber conflicts, you know, we as corporations, I think, have a role to play in, in defending ourselves. And I think a lot of the future of cyber war is going to be played out not as war, but, but as some of these as minor skirmishes. You know, mostly, though, I think we need to stop feeding our fears. Right? Cyber war is a very scary word. And there's a lot of gross exaggerations out there, mostly perpetrated by individuals and companies who are making quite a lot of money from governments on cyber war. I mean, yes, the phenomenon is real, but you know, we, are not in a, we are not a world at war, and that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. Right? But, but these broad cyber conflicts are happening, and, and they're happening you know, to corporations. You, saw, you remember what happened to Sony last year. You know, they were, because of you know, just some quirk of fate, the company that, ever, that all the uh, hackers loved to kick. And they were damaged pretty severely by, by different cyber attacks. Right? So this notion of you know, directed cyber attack, of advanced persistent threat, is real. It's nothing to, to, to be scared of, but it's something to be prepared for. So with that, I'm going to sit down, and I think we'll take questions after, uh, after a bit. Thanks very much.